North Korean Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un <laughs> appeared in public for the first time in about a month, having lost a surprising amount of weight. Another proof point in my theory that the only people who lost weight during the pandemic are genuine f***ing sociopaths. I mean, I do love that. I love... I love a, you know, I love a bounce back. Bo- I love a revenge body. I love <laughs> a bounce back after, let's say, a pregnancy or, you know, a a, di- a stint as a dictator. Um, mm-hmm. I love, I love a reveal. I love a new era. I mean, he's giving us, you know, this is his art pop. <laughs> <laughs> Hot Kim Summer. That's right. Uh. And I think, you know, um, I say good for him. <laughs> <laughs> He is a writer, comedian, and editor of the reincarnated Gawker. Back from the dead like an arm from (laughs) underneath the ground, reaching up to grab the ankle of, like, Peter Thiel, I guess. I don't know, whoever. Please welcome George Severus. George, thanks for being here. Hi. (laughs) What an intro. I mean, I sent a series of unhinged emails to your producers because at first I thought I wasn't allowed to talk about Gawker. And then my bosses were like, no, we want as much press as possible. Talk about it. So then I, I so then I sent a follow up email. And I was like, ignore the email where I ask um, John not to ask me about Gawker. Wait, so Gawker's coming back? Yeah, it's happening. And I'm going <laughs> and I'm taking a break from being a gay stand up comedian and podcaster to edit a blog. That's interesting. That's interesting. It is. Yeah, it's truly. Let's get into it. What a week. In a 6-3 decision on Thursday, the Supreme Court upheld Arizona's restrictive voting rules, which lower courts had found to be biased against minority voters. Critics of the ruling fear that this will disproportionately suppress minority votes. Meanwhile, fans of the ruling are hopeful that this will disproportionately suppress minority votes. Right. That seems like a pretty self-explanatory one. (laughs) That's, um, I like that joke because Norm MacDonald, uh, talks about the platonic ideal being a joke where the setup and punchline are the same. Yes. And the more similar you can get them, the better it is. Now, that's that's a good example of that. I'm very happy with that. Alan Weisselberg, the chief financial officer of the Trump Organization, surrendered to authorities on Thursday after he was indicted by a grand jury for a 15-year scheme to avoid paying taxes. It's a good thing for Trump that tax fraud and evasion are so infrequently associated with more serious crimes. I think that like the worst kind of resistance tweets are the ones you tweet in your own heart. Yes. And there was this moment where I was like thinking about this. I was just just thinking about it. No evidence, pure speculation. Like, all right, if I was planning to indict Donald Trump for a host of crimes, what would I do? Would I telegraph that that is something that might be coming? No, you would not want to do that. You would not want to have the chaos and noise of a Trump indictment to exist before he was indicted. You kind of just want to show up at Mar-a-Lago and knock on the door and catch them by surprise. And so I had this little part of me, this little little resistance Twitter bot in my mind being like, it could happen. It was like the, like when they were talking about the Russia investigation, it was like, the impeachment eagle has been released. The Supreme Court has issued an indictment against uh, Steve Baden. He'll be hung on the White House steps. Um, that's where my head has been going, just for fun, sure. just because I'm a little bit broken. Sorry, I know this is the most cliche thing to say, but it is still so hard to keep track. So this specific news story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who is being indicted and for what? <laughs> the Trump Organization is being indicted the, the corporation yes. and Alan Weisselberg, mm-hmm. who is the CFO of the organization. But it seems to be that they are trying to get at him. He's Got not it. cooperative. So it seems like they are trying to, you know, turn up the heat, as it were. You know, basically, I, f- I think we're at the place where Stephen D'Onofrio is walking in and kind of tilting to the side right, 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 right. and saying he knew you know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> God, truly, I, I promise I am more, normally much more fast on my feet than this. But it's like it is impossible with Trump to come up with anything. I I, I, I like my internal my internal sensor is such that it actually doesn't even let me speak anymore when when the topic of Trump comes up. And and honestly, that's like the only that's the correct response. Um, <laughs> like, I, I'm honestly like, that's it. We covered it. All right. Great. And I just want to say, if you're still in line to vote, stay in line. Stay in line. If you are still in line from in New York City to vote in the mayoral primary, you yes. stay in line. They're st- they don't know how many votes there are. They don't know how many votes there will be. No. it. I truly, I was thinking of like, what would I, if Gawker had already launched, like what would my headline be today? And it's truly like, 
can anyone tell me what's happening with the mayoral race? Like, Mm-mm. please submit tips. I, I it's it's completely. <laughs> I I have no idea what's going on. So the New York Board of Elections, they accidentally included a bunch of dummy ballots in their That's original right. count. Okay, so then they said, "Whoopsie doodle." Well, they released the notes app apology. <laughs> they did put out a notes app apology saying um, uh, that they're sorry. For the election, they're sorry about what what they said about Britney in the '90s. Uh, they kind of got <laughs> all of that in there, right? And so then they started the count again. And then today, this is we're recording this on Thursday evening. The Board of Elections said they will, and this is a quote: "Maybe end quote share results for a host of other elections tomorrow, but they're just not sure uh, because George, you know what they say about voting in New York: if you can suppress it here, you can suppress you it. You can anywhere. suppress it anywhere. That's right." Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, God, what a what a selection. Never have I felt more um disempowered uh with with my voting choices. Actually, I guess that's not true. I mean, I guess, I guess I haven't loved my choices over the past few years, but um yeah, like just simply no excitement in the polls. I mean, it it, it I think the energy was everyone truly just like throwing their uh ballot at at the person collecting them. As of as of this recording, it looks like Nobody knows what's going to happen, and nobody is sure, and anyone who is sure seems to be silly. But it does look like we went from, wow, Eric Adams dominated, what does that mean for progressivism in America, Right. to Catherine Garcia is now likely to win. And then it's like, wait, so our takes without subtlety vis-a-vis Adams were not only wrong if Adams did win, but they are... They are overtaken by events because he didn't win. Now we have Catherine Garcia requiring new and vastly more subtle takes, right? Uh, which nobody is interested in providing. Yes, I mean, I, it's like, I, don't, I mean, there's something about the Catherine Garcia thing where it's like, maybe the New York Times endorsement is a big deal, <laughs> or yeah. or maybe I, don't, I mean, or the the Andrew Yang thing truly broke my brain because I really like. I like to think of myself as a pretty savvy media consumer. And I really do think like at this point, I have been burned enough times since like 2012 to understand that like Twitter is not real life. And somehow Mm. they got me with Yang. Like somehow I really was like, this is our biggest hurdle in a way. I haven't felt that like, I don't know, unaware in in a very long time. And it just like snuck up on me that in fact, the real um, the real challenge was Adams. And then. And then there was just this like rush at the end to get everyone behind Maya Wiley. And I and I had like, I have to say from the beginning, like I read that Rebecca Traister profile of, of Maya Wiley and I thought it was good. But even the tone of that was very much like, she's OK, you know, like she checks some, you know, checks some boxes policy wise. But we'll see. Like I, I, I it was very difficult to get excited for her. And it's very funny that that she ended up being who people rallied around. Yeah, well, I mean. You know, the, the Diana Morales campaign ate itself, which was probably bad yes. for, for that camp. I think it's always been just... Yes, just no, a, definitely, just definitely bad. I mean, that is a whole other... There, I thought I was being the intelligent one for being like, Twitter is not real life. Diana Morales is not a serious... I don't want to say she's not a serious candidate, but I was like, she's never going to be mayor. Like, she's too left wing, despite the fact that I may agree with her policies. And then I was proven wrong there because she started gaining momentum. And, th- and then the unionization thing happened. And I was like, oh, no, this is not a big enough story to tank her campaign. And of course it did. So I think the only thing I've learned is that I truly cannot determine when Twitter is or is not real life. Well, then I wonder, too, though, if what you end up with is a ranked choice voting system. No one candidate has built a kind of excited coalition to kind of win overall Adams has this big, big, big support, but there's a lot of concerns from the left, the center and left about him for various Mm -hmm. reasons. Uh, The left doesn't coalesce around really any figure until late. And if you end up with someone like Catherine Garcia winning a kind of center left experienced (laughs) sanitation commissioner who like just like smoke wants to smoke cigarette and do work right. charts like that seems OK. <laughs> like maybe that's what ranked choice voting is all about. I am a former smoker. I'm a Nicorette user. But despite mm-hmm. I find it very charming when a politician has flaws that um, kind of, uh, you know, it's very 80s to be a smoker. <laughs> and so that I find that charming. And then I think. And there's also a part of me that's like, I'm so pessimistic with New York politics and honestly with any local politics that I'm like, 
I'm like okay with a centrist and not just that, but I truly am already nostalgic for de Blasio. <laughs> like tr- I remember when I went in to vote and I was like, you know, whatever. I-, I-, I went in to vote and I truly was like, you know, like the first thought I had was like, maybe we should have given de Blasio a chance. <laughs> wow. The rare, the rare advocate for a third de Blasio term. Anyway, this is this is the official position of the new Gawker, by the way, is that we're actually corporate centrists. We support uh, Catherine Garcia and we think de Blasio really got the short end of the stick. (laughs) I will say, look, if 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 trends are correct and it turns out Catherine Garcia does become the next mayor or move on to the general election uh, against adult to become the next mayor of New York. Uh, I continue to be a one issue voter, which I still do not understand how she thinks restaurants should not have surprise inspections. I continue That's to believe Catherine that. That's Catherine Garcia's position? Yes, she said that in the debate. She said it in the debate. I keep bringing it up. A few people have tweeted at me saying I'm wrong, but that that happens in virtually everything. Uh, right. But I'm still concerned about the idea of not having any surprise restaurant inspections. I'm hoping she doesn't move forward on that if she indeed does become mayor, just because... Human beings are pe- people are people. And, um, uh, you know, you stay on your toes when there might be a pop quiz. That's all. No, you know? it's true. It's true. I mean, I do wonder, you know, ever the ever the investigative comedic <laughs> reporter. I do wonder <laughs> who's being tipped off. Who knows about wh- what if, oh. what inspection is coming where, which oh, sure. restaurants and which communities are like targeted more than other restaurants and other. Absolutely. Communities. Great, great and important questions. Check, follow the numbers, fo- follow That's the right. money, follow the phone calls, investigate, get to the bottom of it, make sure it's fair, make sure it's equitable, but surprise people. Right. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I mean, a little a cop behavior a little bit, but I, I accept it for, for the sake of, you know, a public health. Look, I wish, I wish we didn't live in a world mm. where you damn well know that at the inspections Friday, some nasty shit may get thrown out <laughs> Thursday. All right. But that's. This, but that's the world we live in. It's true. It's true. They were stripping mold off the jam at Squirrel. All right. I mean, the Squirrel thing really hit me hard. I have to tell you, because that was one of my go-tos when I was in L.A. <laughs> I still think it's fine. My, look, I, I apply the Squirrel rule to the Chipotle rule. Once a place has been found out for having a terrible health code violation of some sort, get in there. Totally. And I was like, I was one of those people who was like, doesn't jam just always have like fresh jam has mold. That's how you know it's fresh. And you just like take it out and then and then serve it. And then I kept telling that to people like food people. And they kept being like, no, like this was worse. Like, that's not how much mold jam should have. (laughs) I see. North Korean Supreme Leader Kim (laughs) Jong-un appeared in public for the first time in about a month, having lost a surprising amount of weight. Another proof point in my theory that the only people who lost weight during the pandemic are genuine fucking sociopaths. I mean, I do love that. I love, I love, a, you know, I love a bounce back. Bo- I love a revenge body. I love <laughs> a bounce back after, let's say, a pregnancy or, you know, a, a, di- a stint as a dictator. Um, mm-hmm. I love, I love a reveal. I love a new era. I mean, he's giving us, you know, this is his art pop. <laughs> <laughs> Hot Kim Summer. That's right. And uh. I think, you know, um, I say good for him. <laughs> <laughs> we say the new gawker says good for kim jong-un yeah i just to just to recap like the new gawker is corporate centrist in its domestic politics and pro <laughs> kim jong-un in its foreign politics and so you know if anyone has any follow-up questions you can reach me at uh, george.severis at gawker.com <laughs> Really fascinating new politics over there at that's uh, right, the Revive right. Gawker. Oh, I mean, this is what they get for hiring a stand-up comedian to be their editor. <laughs> Ikea announced this week that 10 designers had created special love seats inspired by various pride flags to celebrate Pride Month. Prove once and for all that no matter your gender identity or sexual orientation, love seats are too small to comfortably nap on. I was just... Interesting. Was <laughs> was I was brutal. like, where's that going? <laughs> I saw I, I it's very rare that like something, you know, whatever. We've all been on the Internet for many years. It's very rare that something really makes me feel insane. And this really was it for the past for the last month. Like this was what this is one of those things that really broke me. It really bothered me also that I, I went and looked at the sofas, the mm-hmm. love seats. And it was like, wait, these aren't even these don't even look like they can be for sale. Like this one's made of flowers. They're simply not functional. 
And the flower one was beautiful, but obviously not for sale. It looked yeah. like something. It looked like um. It looked like the flowers were growing out of it. It looked like um pride version of a couch, as if it were a monster from The Last of Us. Yes. Does that make no, sense? It's, yes, definitely. Um, but there beautiful. Was a, right. There was a. I mean, the flower one was a little Annihilation starring Natalie Portman. Yes. It was very much like they're yes. going into the ether or whatever it was called. Mm-hmm. And suddenly mm-hmm. the couch is coming to life. Um, there was one that was more muzzy, like the children's t- television mm-hmm. show. Um, there was a non-binary I, SNL a non-binary, one. yes, that's right. It was like putting lipstick on a pig. Like the couch itself kept being like the simplest possible couch you could think of. <laughs> and they just kept like sticking things on it. Like they were just like... You know, just writing the word oppression on the cushion. And it's it's like, I don't know. I mean, maybe one of them could be a longer couch. One of them could be I don't, maybe an L shape for the bisexual one. And, you know, mm-hmm. one side is sure. for one gender and one side is for the other. Yes. The bisexual love seat was, I would say, chilling. Uh, it did yes. look kind of monstrous and unsettling. Not something you'd want to sit down. And it looked like if you sat, you could not get back up, that it would keep you. In its right. bisexual grasp. Pat was talking about this on your show, which is like, okay, we went through like criticizing corporate pride. Now it's almost hack to criticize corporate pride. It's like, mm-hmm. yes, everyone agrees it's silly, but we all just have to do it for a month. And now it's just we're in the Dada era of corporate pride advertising. We're like, this is full, uh, uh, just a full on performance. Like corporations, by definition, really can't be courageous because they don't have anything to fear (laughs) they are they are legal entities but so like they recognize it is in their interest to stand up on behalf of lgbt people uh it is true that it was nice when certain companies recognized that sooner and i think they deserve credit for that for saying you know what this is a this is actually a market we need to be paying better attention to there's some value and i think good in that. But now that everybody's doing it, it becomes almost like Super Bowl ads where they have to kind of outdo one another to find the way to show that they're the most proud, most proud that they can be. But of course, all of that is aimed at public facing marketing when, uh, you know, I, (laughs) it's like, we got a whole, we got the whole Marvel universe and like the gay character and age of infinity war is like a guy in a therapy session saying i have a boyfriend (laughs) like there's so little actual gayness like i guess dumbledore is gay jk rowling transphobic jk rowling is like dumbledore's gay dumbledore's gay and then they come out with these prequels or whatever they are fantastic haunting beasts and where to hunt them whatever it is Yeah, yeah and then then now we've got jude law and johnny depp maybe all i know is they have this opportunity to show these gay characters and apparently they're being incredibly oblique about it, like barely showing it, implying it, hinting at it. And to me, like, that's a great example of what, like, corporate pride really boils down to. It's like, sure, we'll be pride in what we know the the, the gays will see. But for the stuff for everybody, we're going to be pretty we're going to be pretty subtle about it. I do love like that. The one place people truly can successfully organize is to like. <laughs> is to like pressure corporate entities to like add a line saying someone has like a mental illness in a TV show or something like it's just like if we could take the energy that people are <laughs> that people are putting into like to being like we need a poly character on the OA into <laughs> anything else it would be an abs- we'd live in a completely different world <laughs> A California couple was fined $18,000 after bulldozing at least 36 protected Joshua trees on their property in the Mojave Desert. Or to put it another way, it cost $18,000 plus labor to clear 36 Joshua trees from your property in the Mojave Desert. Wow. That's it. They got 18. They, they, I, you know, the articles are like, ah, they were like, they're not old, but they're like old enough and they seem contrite. They knew what they were fucking doing. Don't ask for permission. Beg for forgiveness. That's like, right. I will pay a fine. They wanted those Joshua trees gone so they can build some kind of a house. Yeah, the don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness thing. Sorry to, ch- t- to latch on to that. It is one of the most chilling kind of like tech uh, yeah. things. Like I, one of my first jobs out of college was working for Facebook. And it was like that. Don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. And then move fast and break things. And people were like really into those two ideas and it's like both of those are recipes for disaster like one is literally don't ask for consent and the other one is destroy (laughs) everything 
That's the Facebook ethos. And you know what? They did that. They did. And they, you know what? They did move fast and break things. So mission accomplished there. And in fact, they didn't, they didn't ask for um, permission or forgiveness. <laughs> There's this book about Facebook coming out. And instead of blurbs on the back, they just put Zuckerberg apologies. And I really appreciate oh, yeah. that. Just his endless list of apologies. Former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, one of the architects of the Iraq war, has died. He was 88 years young. So here's to a real one. There's a joke to be made about how bringing democracy, he's bringing democracy to hell or something. Sure. Uh, uh, something along those lines. But then I thought, okay, like, who is he in hell with? And it's always fun to make a list of three people in hell. I just always enjoy doing it. I'll give you a few. Robert E. Lee, Dan White, Joan Crawford. Wow. See, it's fun. <laughs> Joan Crawford. I mean. Yeah, she's abusive. She's in hell. Fair. I still don't think she deserves to be kind of like at the cafeteria table with Donald Rumsfeld. I don't, I don't know where she sits. I don't know where sure. the ranking is, but she's down there somewhere. No, she's down. Yeah, I, I understand that. I mean, I guess there's no um, camp exception for hell. You can't be no. like, but I'm a camp icon. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> but I but I did it with like a really, really, really heavy makeup on. Right. But is the that- gays love me. Is that can I go to that section? Robert Oppenheimer, Fatty Arbuckle, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Wait, I, now I'm like, you know when you are faced with such a simple task, like naming three dead people, and suddenly you can't think of anyone who has ever died? They're just three people in hell. That's all you have to yeah. do. The reason I, I like putting Thomas Jefferson there, because he's always on the list of the best presidents. There was this new list that came out of the best presidents, and there he is. He's up there in the top 10. He's number seven this year. Sure. Um, but like... Thomas Jefferson is 100% in hell. And like I think that's like in some, I mean, I don't think nobody cares what I have to say, but it is like a controversial thing to say that Thomas Jefferson is rotting in hell. <laughs> but then it's like, well, I, I know he wrote the Declaration of Independence, but he also enslaved children in a facility that made nails all day. And sure. presumably those kids are in heaven. And if those kids are in heaven, Thomas Jefferson can't be in heaven because you're not going to be in heaven with your captor. Wow. wow. So it seems I, like the logic is ironclad. Yeah. He has to be in hell. If heaven exists, Thomas Jefferson can't be in it. What am I missing, George? Well, you're being very sorry. <laughs> Seeing the window of you making this argument is very like podcaster owns conservative, you know, podcaster owns liberal. Like you making this logical argument about uh-huh. how like, well, if there's good and evil and the good people are in heaven, the evil person must be in hell. <laughs> but I agree. I mean, listen, I don't think, sorry to be provocative, but I don't think anyone who owns slaves hopefully is in heaven. So I think it's a, it's a much broader, <laughs> broader issue. George, question for you. Yes. Do you think heaven is a place where you can keep your secrets or is it a place for people who have no secrets? Wait a minute. George Severus, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for having me. It's, it's, it, was a real, it was a real honor. 